Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here with us. I'm Alegria. Some of you may know who I am, as I've been matching you with our mentees and amazing thought leaders for the last three and a half months. Others may know me as Emily, as I haven't been able to figure out how to change the name that appears on the email yet. In any case, I have been with the APAT project since before the pandemic. I live in Quito, Ecuador, and fun fact about me is that I have over 100 cacti in my house. And I'm so honored to work with all of you. As your host, I want to open by sharing a word on behalf of the organization. Thank you for believing in your voice and in ours and for uplifting so many others. We are the Opet Project and our mission is to change who writes history. Our mission is about writing, but it's also about so much more. We are challenging false notions of who holds knowledge and who has authority. We invest in and celebrate diverse knowledge and ideas and through our programs across the nation and the globe. And now that it's there, we are elevating new stories, overrepresenting the underrepresented and making the world smarter one voice at a time. We're also building a fleet of initiatives to bring new voices to some of the world's biggest problems. Problems that cannot be solved justly or sustainably without a diversity of voices and knowledge, expertise, experience, and identity. Our current investments include initiatives on aging and longevity, racial justice, public health, and climate crisis. Right now, I want to spotlight a few of the pieces of our community, some of which you yourselves have mentored. Our community includes scholars, historians, and activists, as well as everyday citizens. We have also been working with doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and emergency responders, overwhelmingly women and people of color. These slides show just a few of the many thousands of pieces they and others have written in the past few months. This is a powerful experiment, and we're so grateful that you're such a big part of it. And now I want to show a two minute video with mentees and mentor editors from across the years of what this work means to them. The OPEP project matters all the time, but it matters even more in 2020. The OPEP project is so important because it empowers people to share their voice. It helped me place a story which went so viral, it landed on the front page of the New York Times. I don't know that I will ever get over the OMG moment when a fellow realizes they're being published for the first time. It's a tough proposition to get so much published by such amazing newsrooms across the country. It was a much deeper impact for me of understanding that my expertise matters in the world. Had I not had this experience, I wouldn't have known that my voice counted. To also learn to say things that other people aren't saying. I learned whose stories are missing from the narrative, and it inspired me to build an online platform so that more people's stories could be shared. I really realized how effective these virtual worlds could be. That connection, that emotion, that community was sustained on Zoom was really amazing. The fellowships may end, but their transformation does not. There is something so purposeful and thrilling about being in a room full of people who are all there because they care. It's been inspiring to see how impassioned they are. You really feel empowered to know that you each have something really important to say and you just need the tools. Translate your expertise, your writing, your advocacy, your leadership. Have the confidence to make your ideas a reality. And we get to change the world and watch those around us change the world. Thank you, Kat. And with that, I want to turn it over to our wonderful founder and CEO, Katie Orenstein, who will give us a 10-year overview of the organization and mentor editor program. Hey, thank you. And, and welcome. welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see you. So a lot of you know how we began and some of you don't. So I'm gonna do the world's fastest version of how we began and how even I got into this. So for those of you who've seen it already, just bear with me for a minute and everyone else, I just wanted to take a moment to catch up. 
Um, I come from a loving family that disagreed on everything. I have a really large extended family. This is my family. I was the youngest. No one ever agreed on anything. I was always saying, why are we going with that version? That's not what I think happened. I was always that like controversial kind of like, that's not the story person was like that in school, studied folklore. I read a folklorist named Zora Neale Hurston. She had written a book about collecting stories in Haiti and Jamaica. And I thought that's what I wanna do with my life. So I applied for a grant to follow in her footsteps. But when I got to Haiti, it was the early nineties, a coup broke out. And so I began writing about what was happening in the streets. And eventually I became what some people call a journalist. I never called myself that because journalism and folklore are fields that don't trust each other. And I, I bet you know what I mean, but just to be explicit, journalism worships the God of objectivity and folklore worships the God of versions, many different versions of the truth. And so for maybe 10 full years of my adult life, I lived in a constant crisis of identity, not knowing who I was or what I was about. But eventually I began to realize that the questions that were driving me were not necessarily the questions that drove the field of journalism. I think a lot of people in the world of journalism, like most people in general, when we think about how history in the news gets made, we think about what are the facts. And I think obviously that's a really important question, but to me, not the most important. To me, the most important question is who is telling the story? You know, we live in an infinite ocean of facts and events and people and interpretations, and somehow through it all, we choose a thread that we call history or histories. And I think even that's inadequate. It's an infinite ocean. Which facts do we pay attention to and who chooses? who is telling the story. So that's pretty much what I have written about for most of my life, lots of different topic matter, but almost always focusing on who is telling the story and how does that change the story. I never thought I would start an organization though. And then, you know, 12 to 15 years ago, there was a big debate that broke out. And there was a debate that broke out about why we hear so few voices in the world and especially so few women at the time that was the focus. And um, we have, a, we, I think we're not gonna show them but I wanna give you a, just a sort of statistical state of voice. Overall, women had about 15% share of voice across a spectrum of forums at the time. Op-eds, television talk shows, corporate boards, tenured faculty, uh, you name it. And voices of color were about 13%. So a really narrow, narrow range of view, viewpoints being heard. And during the middle of this, Larry Summers, who was then the president of Harvard University, made some very provocative comments. He wondered why there were so few women in higher math and science. Could it be that women lacked the biological aptitude? Do folks, I always want to ask, do folks remember that? Show of hands. How many of you remember that? Yeah, of course. And it sparked parallel debates, one of which was about the nation's op-ed pages. Pissed a lot of people off. Um, there was a very public fight at the LA Times when a columnist accused the, uh, man, the editor of sexism. And then a uh, columnist at the New York Times, Maureen Dowd, said, no, no, it's not sexism, it's socialization. And it, went, it was a big, hairy discussion. And I watched with a lot of interest, in part because I study these things, in part because I was part of that world, but mostly because mostly because I was writing for some of the outlets that were weighing in and I knew something behind the scenes and it's this. The single greatest predictor of who gets published is who pitches and the pitching ratios were shockingly skewed. And this is a data point from 2008, the year of our founding. The Washington Post tracked for five months their submissions and they found that nine out of 10 pitches came from men that they identified as such by pronouns. And that is exactly or almost exactly the ratio that they published, nine out of 10. So it occurred to me that pitching was predicting publication more surely than fourth grade predicts fifth grade. And why don't we get more women identifying people pitching? This is where I get to take a moment to say that this work over 12 years has been so expansive around the, the questions of identity and representation. And we consider our mission to be about representation in every form, in every way, regardless of your gender or identity or position. It's about a lot more than gender, certainly a lot more than binary gender. But I wanted to give you just a little sense of what was the instigating conversation. And this was it. I also wanna tell you why we at the Op-Ed Project and why me personally, why we think it matters. And the reason it's not about Op-Eds, it's about putting ideas into the world and how ideas come to change the world. So I, I wanna show you a chart that we use a lot in our workshops, this is it. Um, this is a chart of how ideas and individuals rise in influence and the, the, you, you can check this and your gut, there's nothing magical about this. We just created this to show a principle. You are all on this chart already, every single one of you. And the gist is if you have an idea and you wanna change the, the world, you can't just hold it in your heart. You have to find a way to put it out into the world. 
maybe through an op-ed, maybe in other ways. And then there are the opportunities for it to rise and change things. And if you wanna change the world, you need to be in the places where there are disproportionate opportunities to do that. So that's the work that we're doing and you're doing with us. And it is undeniable, repeatable, concrete um, impact over and over again. One of the most exciting things about this work. Um, this tells you a little bit about our strategy, but not about why we think it matters on a cultural level. And the reason for that is the story we tell becomes the world we live in. This is on all our t-shirts. I hope some of you have them because every year, except for last year, we, we've sent you a gift and some years we give you an option and maybe some of you have t-shirts and if you don't, I hope you get them or ask us for one so we can send you one. Um, this, I'm a, I am a folklorist. This is what I study. Um, you know, some, sometimes people talk about stories as if you tell them long after the adventure rather than before, but it, that's the way it works. The story comes first. The story we tell determines what wars we fight, what diseases we fund, who gets birth control, who gets elected to office, who the police force see as threat, who the police force protect, who gets to go to college, who gets put in prison, everything, that the issues that we're seeing around us today in every way and form are shaped by the story that we tell and the story comes first. And that is why it's so important what we're doing together with all of you and what you have given us and given so many other people the opportunity to change the story. That's what it is. Um, we're 12 years old, so I want to flash forward. We're a little over 12 years old. We run programs across the nation and across the globe and now entirely in the ether. We run big initiatives, bold. We've been very courageous in trying to do new things to um, bring new voices to seemingly intractable problems like climate crisis, public health and racial equity problems, challenges that can't be solved without a diversity of ideas and voices and knowledge sets. And we are running monthly expert talks to widen the tent of who we say, see and name as expert. I've, I know some of you have joined us. I hope you'll all join us on the next ones. Um, and also I hope some of you, these are paid, paid, and I hope some of you will be expert, join us and give an expert talk if you have one to give. Um, we're running weekly Ask a Journalist webinars. It's like office hours with a journalist who's rooting for you every Thursday, 5 p.m. Each and every one of you is invited. And also if you ever wanna lead one, I hope you'll let us know because that's an opportunity also paid. These are not volunteer. And also probably most powerfully, what I wanna say is you, all of you, we have a network of, you, journalists and commentary writers who are our strength and power. We could not have gotten here without you, truly. You have paved the way for everything we're doing now. And so what I wanna do is go to a gallery view right now and invite you all to take a look at each other and just see each other and notice and recognize how much you all have done and how much we can continue to do together. So for real, I just wanna invite you to look around. You're all amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it took us this long to, to do this. And when you've had a good look, just tilt your head to the right so I know when to move on. All right. Well, with that, I want to pass the mic to my wonderful colleague, Alegria, to share some information about the Mentor Editor Program and you. Thank you, Katie. So I want to share some facts about the Mentor Editor Program while we honor you and show some of your faces. So Kat is pulling that up. Thank you, Kat. All right, so the number of current mentors is 140 and 10 of you have been around for the last decade. Janice Adams, Joe Loya, Mara Casey, Harriet Washington, Sherry Fink, Connie Schultz, Marcy Albuquer, Michael Mazing, Lara Mazer, and Vibhuti Patel, and some of you are here and we're so grateful to have you here. And some of you are brand new, including Meg Wade Clayton. So welcome, Meg. And some of you are having children, including this month, Natasha Alford. So congratulations, Natasha. And fun fact, the mentors who live the farthest away from New York City are Christine Kinelli in Australia and also Lisa Pryor in Australia. We have Junji Mijolo in South Africa. And I'm not a mentor, but you might remember that I'm in Ecuador. And some facts about mentor matches. So since the Mentor Editor Program began, we have made over 4,000 matches. That means we, by which I mean you, are mentoring over 400 people a year, and we're increasing. In 2016, we made 459 matches, and in 2020, we made 556 matches. 
And we've got an average of 41 matches a month in the past four years, but 2021 is already a record year with an average of 75 matches per month. We've got more than 260 matches in 2021 only. And now some facts about mentees. 80% of alums identify as women or non-binary and 51 identify as non-white. Approximately 30% request a scholarship or are paid for by a sponsor. On average, a participant in one of our workshops has 32% success rate on publishing an op-ed by the one year point. But that is if they don't work with one of you. Participants who work with a mentor editor have a 73% success rate in publishing an op-ed by the one year point. And many of them publish repeatedly. Hi, Najiri. <laughs> and some of them become mentor editors themselves. Hi, Chandra. Hi, Seva. <laughs> I see you. Um, and fun fact, one of the most surprising matches ever made by Emily, who's here joining us today, was Patsy Ray Dawson from Dallas in 2016, where she argued that sexless marriages should be considered premeditated attempted murder. And with that, one of the most exciting matches in recent years is Sylvia Foti, who came through our Chicago public program in 2018 wrote about her grandfather, who was widely regarded as a Lithuanian war hero. Buildings and schools were named after him. But in fact, she discovered that he was a brutal Nazi collaborator responsible for the deaths of thousands of Jews. In June, Emily matched Sylvia with mentor editor Michael Massing, who worked for her for many hours. In July 2020, her opera ran in Salon.com, and by September 10, the New York Times published a front page account. Sylvia wrote another op-ed in the New York Times and just published the book, The Nazi's Granddaughter. As a result, the history of Lithuania has been thrown into upheaval. Protests have been staged by historians outside the door of the Genocide and Resistance Research Center of Lithuania, which is the arbiter of Lithuania's history since its independence. She literally changed history. So in case you're curious about who is making the matches, I started mentor matching on January 1st this year. And one of my first matches was Vibhuti Patel with Bria Walker about everyday readers to re-examine the life and reaching role the arts have in their lives. I think Vibhuti was trying to join us. I don't know if she's here yet, but if she is, hi Vibhuti. <laughs> and um, before me, there were several other mighty mentor matchers. Emily Pintel, hi Em, we miss you, <laughs> is here. We're so happy she's here. And she oversaw mentor matching from July 2017 to December 2020. And Catherine Baxter, who is also here, hi Kat, oversaw mentor matching from 2015 until 2017. And before that, Erica Fry oversaw mentor matching from 2011 to 2015. And before that, we were very ad hoc. Some of you may still remember it. I'm gonna call on you again, Seba Khan, Mara Casey, Marcy Albuher, Janice Adams, and Michael Massing. And I don't think Harriet Washington or Sherry Fink are here, but they were also part of the early crew along with Joe Loya. And in fact, the very first match ever was Joe Loya and Mara Cohen. This was before the mentor editor program existed and we really owe the idea to Joe and we were really happy that Joe and Mara are here with us today to tell us about that first experience in one or two minutes up top. So Mara, may I start with you? Hi, yes, I'm going to take credit for the 4,000 uh, mentor editor teams who have come through the op-ed project. Basically um, what happened was I signed up for one of Katie's um, seminars in San Francisco and I flew up from uh, LA and I got the big ego rush of right away having a couple op-eds picked up. And then I hit a little bit of a wall. It had been like a month or two and I became very impatient and I kept pestering Katie for help. And um, she was trying to grow the program. And so she um, introduced me to Joe. And so through that, because of my being such a pest, this entire program was born. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mara. Joe, no, I want to turn. <laughs> hey, Joe. Hey, Lana. So that's not what I recall, but here's what happened. Here's how, here's exactly how I remember it. Um, Katie and I, I'm from the Bay Area, but Katie was in LA for some event. I don't remember what, but um, that morning we had coffee 
and she mentioned that the program was really taken off, but she was staying up till two or three in the morning editing essays. <clears throat> and it was a lot of work because there was, you know, it's, it's an infancy, but everyone like Mara were you know, inspired and they were producing it and she was trying to keep up with the load and obviously it couldn't sustain itself. So I heard that in the morning and then we went to have lunch and, and Mara showed up for lunch in LA. And um, it was a great conversation. I really love She was talking about some ideas that she had for an op-ed. And then she slid the op-ed across and I grabbed the op-ed and I said, I think I know what I can do with this. Let me take a look at it. And I think I might even find a way where we can publish it. So um, I worked with Mara on it. It was a great piece and it ended up getting published and we ended up working together. Uh, we developed a friendship and now loved her voice and we found all these other stories to, to work with. But that started that day because I called Katie later and said, hey, you need to get all your friends who are writers like me and you need to ask, ask us to donate one or two of these a year. This was, this was fun. This was easy. Like, let's do this. And I recommended it. And, um, and Katie ended up formalizing it. I don't even know exactly when, but that's how it started. It was just me listening to Katie and knowing that I could do it. Amada had this really great idea. I don't know if we published that one in the LA Times, or, but eventually... I He's frozen, but yeah, we got it published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for slipping in. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and also another one of Joe's mentees is here, Chandra Boselko, who is now a mentor herself. So Chandra, in a few words, what did Joe's mentoring mean to you? Uh, Joe's mentoring, actually, I'm going to put it, the, what he mentored me on in the chat. It was, it ended up being, was my first draft that went out to a, a newspaper outside of Connecticut, which is where I'm joining you from today. Um, and Joe, you, as probably everyone knows the advice that the op-ed project gives people about writing op-eds and thought leadership also applies to life. And Joe told me that the best way to write an op-ed is to use shorter paragraphs. And he gave me great advice that I use almost every day, which is get in, make your point, then get out. Uh, and so I use that when I'm writing, I use that when I am sending emails and it's made me a much better writer. I owe all of that to Joe. And I say that all the time, Joe, by the way. And to, to the people I men mentor and the fellows. Thank you, Chandra. <laughs> Thank you so much. So one very moving match that I want to share with all of you. Three years ago, Katie and Kat joined mentor editor Yukari Kane for a visit to San Quentin to meet some of the incarcerated journalists and writers Yukari works with. Yukari told us that she had decided to start an organization, which is now the Prison Journalism Project, founded with her colleague Shaheen Pasha. Last year, we matched Yukari with Dr. Ivy Hilton, the CEO of Youth and Families in Crisis, who participated in a virtual open project workshop in 2020. And she lit up the room. After being matched with Yukari, she appeared in TV with Shaheen and spoke about staying connected with family members who are incarcerated. Ivy, would you say a few words about what working with Yukari and Shaheen meant to you? Ivy, you are muted. I told myself I wasn't gonna do that. Okay, <laughs> so I first wanna thank everyone because the one lesson that I have learned from, from this entire experience, because I've been wanting to write an op-ed for years, right? And I'm still in the middle of it. I'm still very much active in it. But what I know about it is that clearly timing is critical. Timing, purpose, and direction. And to me, that's what Yukari has brought to me. She expanded my world in such a way that I thought I had one little story to tell. But by the time she finished with me, I was exhausted. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I have many stories to tell, but what story do I really want to tell? What story is really critical in this moment right now? And so I can say that not only did she touch my life, but she grabbed into my story in a way that I had no idea was present. And she found my son, who is also a writer. And since then, he has written more articles than I've written <laughs> and, and has been published in that journalism project, which I am so grateful for. It gave him empowerment. It gave him encouragement. And now in the prison, he is focused on learning to create his own op-eds. And he understands very clearly the power of the written word. And it is not only me that she is mentoring, but she is also mentoring my son. And this has 
truly empowered my life. And I haven't finished with you, Katie. I have a whole lot to give. You just haven't heard from me yet, but you will. That's beautiful, Ivy. Thank you so much for sharing that. Ikari, would you tell us what mentoring means to you? Hi, everyone. Um, I have been so um, influenced by Katie. I came to the op ed project because uh, a colleague from the Wall Street Journal had um, forwarded me an email saying that Katie was looking for mentors. And I just, um, you know, it seemed easy to do and I was happy to give back. And so that's how I got started. And um, and shortly after I started teaching journalism at San Quentin. So it, it really does seem like it's meant to be. I was, I've been, uh, Katie has been a personal inspiration. The Op-Ed Project has been as well. Um, the motto, whoever tells history, writes history has been, I mean, really for me personally, that's, that was uh, my inspiration for the Prison Journalism Project because we started our publication about a year ago when the pandemic happened and everything closed up and we didn't know what was happening inside. And I just felt really strongly that they needed to be part of the history of, of the pandemic. Um, and since then, we've really um, started figuring out how we can bring journalism from inside the walls from across the country. And so that's when um, Katie introduced me to Ivy and um, it's just, um, you know, Shaheen and I both love her. We're not done with you either, Ivy. Um, and uh, and um, it's, you know, her, her Ivy's op-ed is coming. It's, it's, it's a journey and uh, we understand that. And it's been such a pleasure to work with her son, Richard. Um, he's, um, he has written some extraordinary pieces about his, his first days in, in jail and his first year in prison. And, and he just, um, uh, sent us a whole lot um, more detail about those first years and, and how he went from a hopeless situation that last night of freedom before um, it, you know before everything happened and and how he's found hope again and, and we're we're working to to put that out as a as a five part series and so um, you know um, I, I I can't be more thrilled to be celebrating the ten year anniversary and to be a part of it and. Um, you know, congratulations and look forward to, to doing more with you. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you, Akari. That's really moving. Some mentees are so powerful that we hope they become mentors soon. Najari Ruth Lich was matched on three different pieces with Judith Matlov, Kira Goldenberg, and currently Mara Casey. Not too long after participating in one of our workshops, Najari was invited to join the editorial board of USA Today. Najri, tell us what this has meant to you. Thank you so much, Katie and the Op-Ed Project. It's meant everything to me. I believe the Op-Ed Project is truly transformative. I was truly ready to give up. I had so many no's. I'm an academic and academic writing is so much different than Op-Ed writing. And I was so frustrated because from a baby writer's perspective, you send these pieces off and it's like crickets. And I was so frustrated and I signed up for the Thursday Ask a Journalist program. And right before I was about to say, this just isn't for me, I got such wonderful encouragement from one of those editors. Uh, and that led to me publishing my first piece which led to other pieces. It's just so invaluable to have that feedback. Um, and I really do credit you guys for getting me to USA Today and the board of contributors. Um, you know, whether I miss a news cycle and, you know, Judith was great at being honest with that. Oh, you missed this one, you need to reframe it. Uh, I was told, you know, there's no such thing as wasted work. You can repackage this this way, or it's not quite there yet, or no, you should publish this here. It's just been so incredible. I have been able to publish nine op-eds since September, 2020. My last piece published yesterday in USA Today. And it is all because you all have been so generous with your time and generous with your hearts in encouraging other people to share their voice. So I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Najir. That's beautiful. And thank you everyone so much. And we also want to call on Irma McLaren to say a word because Irma has been connected to the Upper Project since before we existed. As you may have read in the chat, 
Irma has identified people in the Native American community to participate in our workshops and has mentored them. Irma, can you tell us why this matters? Well, all I can say is that she who wields the pen holds the power. And I think that, you know, Katie and I are in agreement, the need to get out public voices. Uh, this was my initiative when I was at the Ford Foundation. I didn't fund Katie, but I did fund Ms. Magazine who actually sent me to Katie's workshop and we, we sort of reconnected. But I knew Katie before this, when this was still an idea sitting in the bar in New York, having the conversation with Becky uh, about this. And it's, it was great to see it institutionalized. Uh, and I think in some ways it served as a model for Ms. Magazine to go on and do its writing workshops for feminist scholars. And they now have almost a decade of, of people writing specifically for them. And part of that had to do with women journalists were somehow skittish about being labeled a feminist, which then might lock them out of those other domains. And so we decided to create our own. And so I've learned a lot I've mentored some people through this. And I can't tell you that as a writer, I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I've been writing since I was eight years old. Uh, I was the editor of Transforming Anthropology for 12 years, seven years. So I do academic writing, I do public writing, and I try and find a way to blend them both. And I think for me, um, the affirmation was when in 2015, the Black Press of America named me uh, best in the nation columnist, even though I'm not trained as a journalist. So it's been great and I hope that I can continue to participate. Thank you Irma so much. There are so many other stories that we can't feature because we don't have time, but I hope this gives you a sense of why this work is so meaningful and why you are so important. Thank you again from myself, from my team and from Katie. And now I wanna turn it over to Chandra. For the last year, we've got more submissions that we can manage without regular help. So Chandra is not just a mentor. She's also a member of our team and has been serving with a special role mentoring 10 or more participants a month. We've asked her to answer a few of your most common questions. So I'm turning it over to you, Chandra. Thanks, Alegria. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad to see all the people I work beside every day. Um, doing this mentorship work, that, which is really crucially important. As I said, I was a mentee and now I'm mentoring. So it's, there's a natural cycle here at the op-ed project. Um, a lot of times, I guess people are asking questions to either Emily, Kat, or now Alegria about what to do if they get a certain piece. So I'm just gonna go through these questions. What if my mentee's piece isn't good? Um, I'll be honest, having done more than a couple hundred of these at this point, um, the likelihood of it not being terrific is, is high. And so that's okay because these are people who haven't done this before. That's why they're actually accessing the curriculum and the program. Um, what I generally do, I think, is not to think that we have to do a, like a page one rewrite, start from the beginning and rewrite it for them so that it's uh, more likely to be published, but rather refer them back to the curriculum, the whole breakdown of lead, argument, three pieces of evidence, the to be sure, and then the conclusion. I think that's really helpful because most of the pieces that come in that follow that general structure are okay. They can be worked with and made into something a little bit better, kind of sweetened up. Um, if they're not following the structure, those are usually the, the ones that you that are the most, I guess, problematic for people, for mentors, because they don't know what else to do with them. I always just send them back to the, um, to the curriculum and it really does help. And that's also a service, right? Like saying, this is where you need to go in order to get to the next step, even if you that won't get them actually published, reverting their attention back to the curriculum is very helpful to, to them when you do that. Second, what if I disagree with my mentee? I think there are two ways to disagree. There's a disagreement over something that's like political, like maybe something like a congressional bill, whether it should pass or not. And then there's disagreement over issues related to humanity and rights uh, and hate. Um, I've actually had experience with both, but if you disagree with your mentee, I think it can actually be an exciting process because if you disagree with the main argument of the piece, then you, what your position is should appear in the to be sure. If it doesn't, that's a great way to point out uh, a, a, a flaw or a, a potential area for, for improvement to the mentee. Um, and then I also think a lot of times I've read pieces that I don't agree with it, but I'm actually kind of swayed a little bit by some of the evidence that I either didn't know about or the way that they present it or they spin it even. Um, so it's actually a very good learning experience for me. 
when there are issues regarding people's rights, uh, I actually did have a, uh, someone who he didn't identify as a white supremacist, but he had those types of ideals and it appeared in his work. Um, I push back by just saying very clearly, these ideas are problematic. They are not appropriate for a public forum, but also I just wanna point out that you have no evidence. And I think that that was at least effective for me to let him know that this was not only something that offended me, but also you have no basis for these offensive ideas. Um, and I kept going back at him about the evidence that he lacked, which, I mean, those those ideas don't have evidence, at least not <laughs> ones that we, that um, editors are going to rely on. Thirdly, do you need to be an expert on the topic? I've heard this a lot. I don't think so. In fact, if you think about the times that you've pitched your own work to editors, they probably didn't know anything about what you were writing about and they still saw the idea and the potential in it. So I, I, I edit things that are, I know nothing about. And a lot of times I am very convinced by them. And I think that that's a good op-ed. Times when I don't know anything about it and I'm still not convinced, that's a really good opportunity to provide feedback that you need to explain this more. And if they're locked in jargon, part of the op-ed project curriculum to get them out of it. Um, because it, an editor is not gonna know every topic anyways. And that's ultimately where we want these pieces to be is in front of an editor who's going to say, yes, I, I understand this idea, I like it. I think it should be out there. So I don't think that's a limitation. I know some mentors are saying, I don't. I only cover this area, but it actually can expand your own knowledge base if you work with other people on other, you know, other topics that you're not used to editing or working on yourself. Four, how long should I spend mentoring? I think this depends on the person, the mentee and the mentor. Like if you are really rushed for time, I think, maybe a half an hour total would be appropriate, um, but giving them those like crucial structural uh, points and feedback, and then also maybe sharpening an idea if it's not really clear, making the, the thesis statement or the argument even better than it is. Um, I have had some that I've gone back and forth several times on because I thought it was worthwhile and the, I felt that the mentee was on the verge of uh, making a breakthrough of understanding what he or she had to do. So um, I've spent, anywhere from a half an hour to maybe you know several hours over a number of weeks working with people depending on their potential and also their willingness to kind of invest in the process. If they're really willing to work hard and take my suggestions then I tend to spend a little bit more time, but I think a half an hour, it, no one should feel guilty about that. Lastly, when can you set, where can you send your mentee for more support when you've had enough, which is something that I, fully understand, I should add, I am the person that, who was assigned the woman who said, if you don't have sex with your husband, you're uh, committing premeditated murder. That was my mentee. Uh, it didn't, as far as I know, it didn't get published, but um, we have resources on our website for places pe people can pitch. Also, I advise them to go on Twitter and search around for editors who are looking for pieces on a certain topic. That's a good way to direct them. I generally don't um, share personal contacts that I have with editors only be, because I, a lot of times we don't know these people and I don't know if they're going to respect that relationship and I don't want to be responsible for introducing someone who won't respect the, an editor's boundaries um, but sometimes I do if I really feel that a piece is super important then I tell the person you should try this editor at this publication and send them there but I don't think anyone should feel obligated to share their personal contact information unless they really believe in the mentee and the idea and, and have some degree of trust there. But um, there's a lot, you can also, if someone is looking for a specific editor at a specific publication, they can always go back to Alegria and ask us because we are creating a big list of contacts and we can also help with that too, if you feel that that's necessary, but that's it. Alegria, back to you. Thank you, Chandra. That's super helpful. And now we are doing breakout groups because we want you to meet and greet each other. Um, this is just a suggested outline of what you can say. We are going to, just to be clear, we're going to drop you into groups of four or possibly five just for 10 minutes. People have asked, when can we meet? And, oh, I've never met anyone. So we thought we would give you just a few minutes to meet a few other people. And um, we're going to do that now for 10 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. I hope, um, I feel like that was like the briefest 10 minutes, but I just want to say, I hope you all had as good an experience and conversation in your room as I got to have in mine. Um, uh, that was really lovely. And I can't believe it's been uh, over 10 years. We, we put 10 years or something like that because we actually really don't know when it started. There was um, the first 
you know, the first match that Joe did. And then there was like some stumbling around. I, I do want to say that there was one, I want to highlight one amazing match that happened um, who is, um, I, I have not asked you to speak. So Zeba, you can weigh in if you want, but in 2009, probably the most memorable match in, in that era was you were matched with two people, I think Marcy Albaher and Stacey Sullivan. And I'm just going to brag on Zeba because Zeba entered a contest, a uh, Washington Post contest, along with 5,000 other people to be America's next pundit, great pundit, and beat out 4,999. I think that was it. And we had no money and nothing, but we were like, we need to do a press release. How do we do a press release? And my father to this day talks about that moment. It was so exciting. Um, to this day, he asks, how is Zeba Khan doing? And I just want to um, take a moment to just ask Zeba, how you doing? You want to say, say a word? Uh, I mean, that was, I'm so glad we got the little minute there because it kind of calmed my, when I saw everyone, I just almost started crying. People probably saw me tearing up. So <laughs> I, I, I love this community so much uh, on a personal level for, for so many reasons and obviously professionally, but um, I'm, I, I, I can't say it enough. Like I have so much love in my heart right now. Um, this community means everything to me, the work that we're doing, the work that the team is doing now. And, I, and, and I'm a little bit more removed, but I, I get to hear and see the testimonials again and again. And thinking back, it's, you know, from 2009, I just, I'm almost, I'm at a loss for like for words of the impact that this community has done together under your guidance, Katie. Ugh. And I have so much love for you personally and in my professional hat too. But um, I feel so grateful and I feel so fortunate to be in this community with so many people that I, I love and I am enriched by, just enriched by the minds and the spirits of even the people I don't know yet, but I'm looking forward to meeting um, and as fellow mentor editors. So I feel so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to see your face. I haven't seen your face in such a while and it's so good. Um, we're almost at the top of the hour, everyone. And I promised um, Alegria, I would say one word before I turn it to my friend, my dear friend, Janice Adams, to close us out. But first, I want to say one word about um, all of you and your preferences. Um, Alegria created or Emily created or Catherine created an onboarding form, a little to like one pager, just so that you could tell us what your preferences were. But if you and if you joined us uh, in the last few years, you got one of these. But if you were here from longer ago, you would never have seen it. So the onboarding form is in the chat right now, and we'll send an email out with it. And if you like, you can answer it. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. But it's a chance for you to tell us how often you want to mentor. And do you have any particular interests? Like, I really, really want to um, mentor people who are from the American South or from um, this community or um, I you know, whatever I, whatever it is, you can tell us a bit about yourself. It will take you just a few minutes and we love to hear that. So you'll get that and you'll get an email with a link to this recording and um, whatever other materials we mentioned we'll provide in a follow-up email. Um, but in the last minute, I want to take a moment to shine a light on and also ask um, my friend Janice Adams to close us out. Janice has been an inspiration, a friend, a mentor, a colleague dating back to before the op-ed project even started. Um, she has written, I think, 10 books and over 500, maybe 600 columns by now. Um, and she has started a new novel nonprofit, um, uh, an institute for history and healing that I'm honored to be on the board of. And she has mentored more people than I can possibly name. And I would like to turn it to Janice to close us out with a few words on why this matters. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I when I first started writing a column, I was one of only three African American women writing columns in the nation's papers. In in uh, well, probably not in African American newspapers, but in the nation's quote general media newspapers, major media newspapers. And when you came along and asked me if I would participate in this. Katie, what I saw was possibility. That's what the Op-Ed Project represent, has represented to me. It has represented um, 
a way to fight back <laughs> uh, with giving not only hope to people, I think hope is wonderful, but people need tools. And it was a way to bring, give tools to other people. Um, and so I just say happy 10th to Katie, happy 10th to everybody who is has been there all this time or we'll take it to the next 10. Um, but also thank you so much for enriching the nation really by the work that you do and we need it to continue, we do. So thank you, Katie, thank you all. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I will. I would like to say good luck, good wishes, good like everything to all of you. And this work is about us, but not only about us. If there are people you believe in who would benefit from this work, please invite them to join us as mentors. Please invite them to join our workshops as participants and please nominate anyone you believe in for a scholarship. Um, that's part of our mission too. Um, I send those notes out to all of you as a reminder all the time. That is a standing invitation um, for anyone you recommend at any moment in time. Thank you all again. And also I would like to give a hand to Alegria for a fabulous job um, emceeing that for us. Thank you thank so you, much. Katie. And thank you everyone for being here. This was so exciting. Bye folks. <laughs>